Welcome to Backstage with Richard Ridge, where I sit with some of the theater's best and brightest, just chatting it up. SAG Foundation and Broadway World have partnered for a filmed conversation Q&A series celebrating the vibrant theater community here in New York City and the union actors who aspire to have a career on both stage and screen. This special event, which is being co-produced with the New School for Drama in their John L. Tishman Auditorium, is a career conversation with two of the greatest theater and film titans, Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart, who are known to millions of fans for such films as The Lord of the Rings, X-Men, The Hobbit, and Star Trek The Next Generation. Well, now they are back on Broadway, starring in Waiting for Godot and No Man's Land, playing in repertory at the Court Theater. Please welcome Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart. This is outrageous. <laughs> Who are you? What are you doing in my house? Get some? A whiskey and soda. <laughs> It is you who have behaved unnaturally and scandalously to the woman who was joined to me in God. I saw unnaturally, scandalously. Scandalously, she told me all. You listen to the dribblings of a farmer's wife. Since I was the farmer, yes. <laughs> about time I introduced myself. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome back to Broadway. How does it feel? We love it here. I, ca I, <laughs> I first came in 1967 uh, with a play that I'd been doing with Judy Dench uh, for over a year in London. She didn't want to come to America, so Eileen Atkins came in her stead. Ian McShane was the other member of the cast. We were picketed by uh, Brit uh, American Equity because the entire cast was British, three of us. Uh, uh, it was a play set in Russia uh, at the time of the Cold War. It was vaguely pro-Russian because the characters were sympathetic. America couldn't take it. We lasted for 27 performances. And ever since then, I've been hoping to have a hit on Broadway, and maybe this time we've finally uh, got that. <laughs> Um, 1970 or 71, um, a production from the Royal Shakespeare Company of Midsummer Night's Dream, oh, which has become known as the Brook Dream or the White Box Dream. <laughs> and um, we were a smash hit. We were. <laughs> Plus, I think we How were... How things change. <laughs> <laughs> I think we may have been the only show that transferred from Broadway to BAM, and not the other way around. Well, I know that BAM is one of your favorite theaters, because both, oh. both of you play there. The Harvey, certainly, yeah. yes. It's a magical theater. I think I must hold some sort of record. I've been in three separate productions of King Lear at, at Brooklyn Academy of Music. <laughs> uh, one, once with the Actors' Company, which is a, a company that I helped to found in the early 70s in which the actors ran the whole uh, enterprise. We're, we were our own managers. We employed our directors, etc. Uh, we all got paid the same. We shared the fun of being number one dressing room if we were on tour. And we, I played Edgar in that, uh, and then I came back with the, uh, the National Theatre production with Brian Cox as King Lear, and I played Kent, and then more recently with the uh, Royal Shakespeare Company production, directed by Trevor Nunn, I, I played King Lear. So I feel very at home at yeah. that. Mm. And of course you did Macbeth there. 
Yes, uh, following the, the Brook Dream, yeah. but we did that in the Opera House, which was challenging. Yeah. It's a big space. Sure. Well, we, before we get into No Man's Land and Waiting, Waiting for Godot, we wanted to find out how many people in the room have seen the productions already. <laughs> Raise your hands. <laughs> clap. Well, a lot of you have. Okay. So Waiting for Godot and No Man's Land are two of the finest evenings or matinees anyone will ever spend in the theater. Oh. The two of you are obviously having the time of your lives. What has made this so special for both of you? Well, it's, it has no precedent for me. Now, Ian has run companies before and has experience of being uh, a company leader and a producer. Um, I have not. And it, it may not be known to you, I think it is known to you, that along with Stuart Thompson, Ian and myself and our director are the producers of this show. And also, significantly, investors, which is breaking 101, never invest in your own shows. <laughs> <laughs> but we have done. And so um, and that came about because the creative spur for this event came from the three of us. And having had the idea of doing Godot and No Man's Land, and then with the same four actors and alternating the performances, having come up with the idea, we felt we didn't want to give it away to someone else. That wouldn't it be fun if we were in control of it? <laughs> well, it's largely been fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's largely been exhausting because we are continually attending meetings and, you know, planning meetings and so forth. But that has been, I think, for me, the most exciting part, coupled with an opportunity to do No Man's Land, which I've been waiting to do for nearly 35 years. And Ian, for you, because it started with doing Waiting for Godot, and you had the best time doing that in London, didn't you? We did. Uh, um, it was a very successful production that I... I seemed to change people's view on the play. Uh, they found it much more accessible than they had in the past. I'm not sure that was anything to do with us. We just did the play as, as, as we saw it, and the audiences respond. M maybe the world's grown up around uh, Godot, which was initially thought to be an extremely difficult, obscure play, and, and the stories of the first production in the English, uh, in your country and in ours, is, is of seats banging and, and audiences leaving at, at the intermission uh, uh, uninterested in what happened next. Well, that really has uh, totally changed. And yes, and I had had such a wonderful time and hoped we might revive it. And, and I'd thought we, we'd hoped to come, I think, to, to uh, New York when we were first doing it, but there was another production on here, Tony Page's production with uh, Nathan Lane and Bill Irwin, John Goodman. Uh, so, the, uh, Broadway didn't need two uh, Godos. Uh, so, but uh, when the chance came to, to do it again, uh, I leapt at it. And I, I say, I, it, it, we, we do have this love affair with New York. I mean, I wouldn't live anywhere else or work basically anywhere else than, than, than uh, in London because the, I'm very familiar with it and there's so much work there in comparison with New York. I mean, there are big subsidized companies and they, as well as the commercial theater in the West End and lots of other uh, places <coughs> where you can put on plays. So the, there's a lot going on. It's a good place for an actor to be. But uh, a hit on Broadway uh, uh, and, and the New York sense or Manhattan sense that um, theater is, almost defines New York. Make it there, you'll make it anywhere. That sort of spirit. Uh, you know, is inside us as performers, and, and uh, then we had the cheeky idea of doing two plays at once. And <laughs> as, as producers, we're, that, that's where we came up with our first uh, problem, because uh, we, we, unlike the um, recent productions from the Globe Theatre in London, which came here with uh, Mark Ryan and Sir Richard III, and Twelfth Night, uh, those productions were all dust, done and dusted. They were ready. They just transferred them over. Uh, we had to start from scratch. We, we had two wonderful American actors, which we very much wanted to have. We didn't want to be a, an import. We were a Broadway production. 
We had long rehearsal periods. We, we did uh, No Man's Land in Berkeley, California to run it in, five weeks there. That was very expensive for our production. So we've learned quite a lot about uh, how not to put, to put on <laughs> shows. <laughs> but I must say, uh, hand on heart, that um, this job, and, and we're nearing the end of it now, has been perhaps the best time I've yeah. ever had in the theatre. And, uh, uh, and it's because it's worked with the audiences and uh, both players are uh, relished by us all. So I'm having the time of my life. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Patrick, the same? Yes, very much so. The, we came out of a repertory system and we were mm. accustomed to doing... There was one season with the RSC. I was in five plays and all five plays would at some point be performed every week. So there was nothing unusual in thinking of doing two plays in a week. What is unusual is doing it in a commercial house on Broadway. But for us, it's delicious because the performances can never and will never in the remaining eight, nine weeks become stale because we're always refreshing. And I think accompanied by the way in which the five of us work, that includes Sean Mathias, our director, um, making something as fresh, spontaneous, and immediate as possible every single moment of every night has been the driving force of both productions. But then all of a sudden, hello, it's 7 o'clock on a Wednesday evening and we're doing No Man's Land after four <laughs> performances waiting for Godot. And the plays are very different in their setting and style, while at the same time in content and themes, they overlap perpetually. Yeah. You're actually a perfect foursome up there because you're also playing with Billy Crudup and Shula Hensley. And you have one of the finest directors in Sean Mathias. And Patrick, you had mentioned something backstage that I had told him that I had seen like 16 productions of Waiting for Godot. And I've never truly understood the play until this production, the clarity of it all. And you told me that for the first few weeks. Tell us, you sat yeah. on a table read, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we had six or seven weeks total rehearsal. And the first two, two and a half weeks of that rehearsal period were spent in a room sitting around a table. We never got on our feet. And the principle, which is becoming increasingly a principle, I find with, with directors of a certain age in the UK, is that we read and read and read and discuss and discuss, not in an analytical way of what does this mean? What does it symbolize? But rather, the most often asked question would be, what is going on? <laughs> Who are these people? And good old acting 101, what do they want? And by the time we got on our feet, I think we were, I think we were pretty clear in our heads who we were and why we were there, mm. what our backstory was and what our hopes were. Is that right? Mm. Yes, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was asleep during most of the process. But... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I... It's a stop... We're, uh, after the shows, we, 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 um, we, we meet any of the audience who uh, waited and 48th Street to say hello to us. And um, the number of people who studied uh, Waiting for God at school, I mean, ordinary high school, it astonishes me. I mean, what, what crackpot educationalists thought. <laughs> I know what would be good for the boys and girls. They should read Waiting for God. Well, they should not read Waiting for God. Any more than you should read uh, a Mozart off the page. You listen to Mozart. And you listen to God. You listen to any play. You're an audience. Audio. Audio. <laughs> uh, you can't do it yourself. And witness the fact that it took us two or three weeks. And we're, we're trained to read scripts and still find it difficult. Uh, but it takes us two or three weeks to, to begin to lift the, the words off the page. So why, sh why should someone in high school, led through by a teacher, uh, expect to get in there with it? And, uh, and that's, I think, perhaps why they're enjoying the show so much that they suddenly raise, oh, I see, it's, it's an entertainment, is it? It's a play. <laughs> <laughs>
There's lights, there's music. Yeah. Patrick Stewart sings. <laughs> Dances after a fashion. <laughs> Say, I am happy. I am happy. <laughs> so am I. So am I. We are happy. We are happy. What do we do now, now that we're happy? <laughs> Should have been a poet. Oh, I was, isn't that obvious? Kavulevu. <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon. Kavulevu. Ah, Kavulevu. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to go back to the beginning. Growing up, where did your love for performing begin, and what were your early creative outlets for each of you? My uh, fate was sealed, I suppose, when my sister took me to see an amateur production of um, Macbeth, shortly followed by one of Twelfth Night. I, I, I must have been about eight. I, you know, I was taken to other... Uh, events that might have captured my imagination, like football matches and cricket matches and, and, and opera, actually, and a little bit of ballet. I don't know what it was about those plays uh, in that particular setting. I was riveted as an audience. And that's where I began uh, as an actor, as an audience. And I still am an audience. I love going to the theatre. Uh, can't get enough of it. Constantly hoping to be excited, desperately unhappy if, I, if, it, if I'm not, but always hoping, hoping, and uh, waiting. And um, it wasn't until uh, quite a lot later that I realized that uh, I could enhance my enjoyment of the theater as an audience by getting involved in putting on a play and discovering how it was done. I'd seen so many plays, how do they do that? Why do they do that? What's going on there? And, and, and the way to find out was by acting myself, and I started to do it. But just to drone on a little bit longer, the, the, uh, the, <laughs> I suppose it's the first time that you bump into professionals that, that, that you uh, begin to wonder, could you be one of them? And the first professional performers I saw were not actually actors, but the, they, they were <coughs> vaudeville uh, people. We, we, we had a, what was called a variety theatre uh, in our town in, in the north of England, where each week uh, groups of entertainers, would, professional entertainers, would, would arrive. Um, dog acts, singers, dancers, magicians, uh, and this sort of uh, carry-on. And I was allowed to go backstage because my father knew the owner of the theatre. So at 14 and 15 and 16, every Thursday, I went backstage. And uh, I saw the, uh, it was twice nightly, they did the same bill twice. I stood in the wings and watched these performers touring the country for very little money. Uh, God knows what their digs were like that they were staying in. They were probably all drunk. The backstage conditions, <laughs> the backstage conditions were foul. But there was I standing in the dust surrounded by the hempen ropes which moved the simple scenery and, and, and seeing them trudging towards the stage, exhausted and tired with the day and not much looking forward to the performance. And as the music started stepping out across that line into the light, transformed and transforming possibly the lives of the audience who were watching. Mm. And whenever I go backstage, it doesn't matter whether I'm in the theatre or visiting it, I, I sort of look for that, where is that line that you step out of the dark into the light? And I thought, I've got to be one of these people. Well, I, I'm an, so I, I have a, feel, feel a great kinship for vaudeville people. And um, would, I think there's nothing braver as a performer than being a stand-up comic. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you play Hamlet... <laughs> You better be ready uh, with, with, with the tricks that uh, stand-ups use of galvanizing the audience's attention. And 
making the weights on your next word and, and hoping they might even reply. To be or not to be, that's the question, wouldn't you say? Don't you agree? Have you got an answer? Uh, so it's all connected. And I am still uh, excited by the memory uh, and, and to be able to relive it. Uh, it's wonderful. So, there we go. <laughs> You've heard all that before. No, 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 no. Heard none of that backstage stuff before for the first time. This is why these events can be so delightful for us, and we've spent a lot of time talking side by side, and uh, yet I'm hearing something brand new. Maybe he just makes it all up. <laughs> <laughs> After all, he's an actor. Um, no, I'm an actor, I'm not a writer. <laughs> <laughs> I have one person to thank for everything, and I talked to him on the phone just a few weeks ago. He is 96, oh, and he God. was my English teacher in a very, very <clears throat> non-academic school. Very non-academic. <laughs> Are you leaving? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this was the man at the age of 12 who put a copy of Shakespeare, it distributed copies of Merchant of Venice around the classroom. Remember, these were, this was a school where children came in Wellington boots without socks all oh, year 12. round. 12. 12. And... Um, he said he cast the trial scene. And he said, all right, read it. And so we all began to, to ourselves. <laughs> of course, we thought we had to read it. And he said, no, 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 this is a play. It's not a book. Yes. Read it out loud. And for the first time ever, I spoke Shakespeare out loud. And for a reason I cannot fathom, I had an immediate instinct for it. And feeling for it and love for it, even though much of it I didn't understand. <clears throat> and uh, not much later, this same English teacher put me in a play with adults, playing a small part of a, a schoolboy in the play. And the first time that I walked onto the school hall stage, which is where this drama club performed, in rehearsal, I experienced a feeling I'd never had before. And you must understand, this is years of expensive California therapy that has helped me to understand. <laughs> <laughs> Coupled with brooding on it anyway, I felt safe for the first time in my life. So what was that defining moment? Do you remember the defining moment where you said, I'm going to do this for a career. I have to be an actor. This is when I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to do this. Sitting in the office of the editor of my local newspaper, a weekly newspaper where, against all the odds, I had been given a job. The, the two of us started on that newspaper on the same day. Myself, at the age of 15 and one week old, having finished the minimum education that the state um, insisted on, and the other one was a Cambridge graduate. Um, <clears throat> it didn't work out for me. <laughs> um, Largely because I was involved with so much amateur theatricals. By the time I was 15, I was at one point rehearsing with six different companies in my local town. We were, everybody, everybody performed in my town. And um, he sat me down and he said, things are not working out. Largely because you're never available and you're never here. And you're making up copy that, you, that isn't true. <laughs> and <clears throat> you're having people phoning reports into you and then you're writing them up and they're full of inaccuracies. <laughs> and it will not do. <clears throat> so either you decide you're going to be a newspaper reporter and you give up all this amateur theatricals or you get off my paper. And I thanked him and I left his office and I went upstairs to the reporter's room, packed up my ancient Remington and walked out with a couple of friends on the paper who had been very kind to me saying, no, no, don't do that, this is a terrible mistake. And I went home and told my parents I was going to be an actor. I was an undergraduate uh, in an undergraduate production of um, Henry IV, part two, 
directed by John Barton, who uh, shortly after has left uh, academia to go and help uh, Peter Hall run the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford. Uh, Derek Jacobi was uh, Prince Hal, uh, and I was playing Justice Shallow, a very old man, in a big pointy hat and a long beard. <laughs> Hang on a minute. <laughs> Uh, and I slavishly copied every note, every, every, every inflection, every tone of voice that, that John Barton gave me. I mean, he gave me the entire performance and I just copied him. Uh, and was rewarded with a, a, a wonderful review in a national newspaper that, that, that came. It, it's my favorite review of all because it, uh, uh, we didn't have our names in the programs. It, it was just a uh, you know, gentleman putting on plays. You don't want to advertise yourself. <laughs> Uh, and the critic said, we'd like to know the name of this actor because it would clearly be a name to remember. Aww. Well, you know, at, at 20... Oh, well, at, at, <laughs> at 21, crazy about the theatre, with no ambitions to be an actor at all because I'd seen the great actors. I knew I wasn't up to it. Mm. But then this man said in the paper, and, and a friend said to me at the stage door on this little paving stone, I can still go and stand, and he said, so are you going to get yourself an agent? I said, what? Well, he said, after that review, you, you'll be able to get an agent and become a professional actor. And I said, great. <laughs> Since we have so many drama students here today, you have each played many of Shakespeare's greatest roles. Which has been the easiest role for each of you to grab hold of, and which has been your hardest challenge? Simplest part in Shakespeare is Iago. Why is that? Wow. <laughs> Well, I Iago is, is the guy in the play Othello who uh, brings down destruction on, on his boss and, and his boss's marriage and, and many of the people surrounding uh, because he is the most jealous character in the play and uh, we could, I could talk about it for hours, but uh, he does the most dreadful, dreadful thing but everybody in the play keeps saying of Iago, what a wonderful man he is. Honest Iago. <laughs> kind Iago. Thank you, Iago. What would I do without Iago? Uh, and then when they've gone off stage, uh, he, he turns to the audience and says, fools. Uh, and so you become complicit uh, with his lying. So all you have to do as Iago is not play a nasty man, but play a very nice man. And the story does the rest. You don't, it's, there's no problem, Iago. <laughs> but you, you, you will see Iagos who think it is a difficult part, and, and whilst they're being nice to everybody, they keep turning to the audience and saying, no, I'm not really nice at all. Well, that's difficult to do and stupid to do, and you don't have to do it. Um, the easiest, actually, was... They're both quite recent roles, and I played them both in the same season at Chichester. I played... At Malvolio in Twelfth Night, and I, same season I played Macbeth, which came here to New York. And um, one night in the Macbeth dressing room, because we were all, it was, as Ian was saying earlier about his experiences, we were, all the men were in one room, all the actresses were in another room. And we were fooling around, saying, have you noticed not one of us in this production of Macbeth has a Scottish accent? <laughs> So, just for jokes, we began running scenes in broad Scottish accents. And, and then it was um, <clears throat> Mickey Feast said, you know, that would work for Malvolio, which we were due to start rehearsing the next week. Next morning, Saturday morning, I got up and I did what I never do in advance, but I read Malvolio outlined in a Scottish accent, and the role was solved, in instantly solved. Everything hinged around that accent. And, um, uh, and that was kind of easy. But the most exciting and challenging was, without doubt, the Scottish play. I loved every single minute of it. We closed at the Lyceum Theatre here in New York 365 days after the first preview in Chichester. So it was a year, basically, of Macbeth, and it nearly finished me off. But it was, a, it was every moment absolutely memorable. Yeah. The most difficult part I remember playing 
uh, was Romeo. It's a pill of a part. I mean, if, if you had the choice, just play Juliet. And, and <laughs> uh, Ju Juliet is the leading part. And if the play were called Juliet and Romeo, I don't think you'd get people queuing up to play Romeo. I would actually say the same of uh, Cleopatra and Antony, which, uh, but here I'm sitting next to a great Antony. Uh, so, and you wouldn't agree with me there, but I mean, uh, Juliet is the part. Romeo, I found extremely difficult. I was too old to play it. I was 38. In fact, I was playing the same season I was doing Macbeth. I used to do Romeo in the afternoon and Macbeth in the evening. <laughs> Yeah, but this, this, was the, this was the fun of it, wasn't it? <laughs> and, and the next day I was I doing... I it was, yes. And, and the next day I was doing Leontes. I was doing the three together. <laughs> but Romeo, you can only play a part like that if, oh, somehow you totally inhabit it or it inhabits you. I don't know what it is. But I was so concerned to get the rhythms of that early Shakespeare right. Uh, so aware of the responsibility of making the audience fall in love with you, because if they don't, they're not going to care. And so I was showing off like Billio and, uh, and didn't, didn't relax into it. And it took me a, a good six months to get into that part. That, that's the luxury of, of, of these companies, so few of them around. You go and you start playing Romeo at the beginning of the season, and by the end of the season, 100 performances later, you might begin to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you can go on the road with it mm -hmm. and yeah. tour it or bring it to the States. <laughs> uh, and um, it took me a long time, but uh, Romeo, I, can, I still squirm at uh, my performance. Well, you, you, you squirm um, unnecessarily because oh. I saw that and it, it was wonderful. And it had in it the most electrifying moment. Uh, it was not quite your moment, actually, though you shared it. <laughs> but I've, I've ever seen on stage, Francesca Annis was playing Juliet. And in the tomb scene, when she is dead, lying on the kind of out, and Romeo comes here, and he's going to... Uh, does he drink the poison, too, or does he stab himself? Both, I think, is it? He drinks the poison. Yes. Well, just before that moment arrived... Juliet made the first movements of coming out of the drug, and we all saw it, and he didn't see it. And I mean, I swear the night I was in, there, there might have been people saying, look behind you, <laughs> she's moving. And <clears throat> why was it so potent? It was, a, it was a shocking moment, but it was because the audience were completely inside the scene. It was terrific, yeah. It was absolutely well, terrific. Well, that was, uh, that moment was uh, not ours. It was stolen. And As it, often, many of the great moments in Shakespeare oh. proved to have been stolen. Oh, that's right. <coughs> Dur during the rehearsals, uh, Rudolf Nureyev, the, the Russian dancer, was uh, uh, dancing Romeo. And I wish I could tell you who was his Juliet. I mean, I did see uh, Margot Fontaine, his great partner, <coughs> but I think this was another production. However, at the end, uh, Juliet's arm, um, on the instruction of Nureyev, who'd choreographed it, went up as he was dying. And Trevor Nunn and I, the, the director uh, of our show, we were watching this together, and we both looked at each other and said, <laughs> 